Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. God bless you, Pastor David. Train him coming into your heart, your life, your car, your home. Thanking you for tuning in to today's teaching, What's This World Coming to? Or subtitled, The Last Days and Times. As I've been saying, we're going to be um, continuing in the series and we're going to be looking at today, The War of Armageddon. Now, um, let's jump right into this. The Bible reveals that there's going to be a war of all wars that brings the reign of Satan in the earth to an end. And this war brings an end of the tribulation period, the second half, which is referred to the great tribulation period. Remember, seven year period of time broken into three parts, or I should say two parts, uh, three and a half year periods of time. And so, and what it does is this ushers us into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Here, Christ is going to rule on this earth for a thousand years, okay? And so the war of Armageddon is not going to destroy the earth. It's going to set the earth up for the true reign of Jesus Christ here on this earth. And as I said, that will be for a thousand years. Now, this war of Armageddon, it's not going to be a natural war. It's not fought with natural weapons, even though the nations of the earth are going to gather to stand in opposition to Jesus Christ and you and me and his saints, you know, that would come back with him. And they're going to amass all of their military weapons and their intelligence. So let's look at Revelation chapter 16. It says, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the kings from the east might be prepared. In verse 13, it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Verse 14, For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Verse 15, Jesus says this, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And verse 16, it says, and I'm going to end reading here. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Now, the Euphrates River drying up and kings coming from the east is significant as it reveals the geographical location that many of the enemies of God are going to come from. This eastern, eastern region is not necessarily east of the United States per se. Remember, the center of end time events, as I shared earlier in the teaching, is going to be Jerusalem. And these nations will come from east of Jerusalem. So they're going to come from east, from the east of Jerusalem the nation of Israel. And geographically, these nations can be Syria, Iraq, Iran, and Turkey. Now, remember, we talked about Gog and Magog when we were uh, referring to what was going to be happening. We began to reveal the, um, the Antichrist, and we talked about Gog and Magog. And that was in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. And we said how they're going to align with Russia against the Lord. You see, the Euphrates River is going to be dried up. And if you pay attention to the current situation of the Euphrates River, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, you'll see that it's been drying up. I said for the past 20 years, but in further searching it out, it's been drying up for the past 50 years. But it has accelerated its drying up over the last 20 years. And so this leads some people to believe that the sixth seal has already been released on the earth. And when you add this prophecy to the plagues that the earth is seeing and COVID, monkeypox, polio, and other epidemics, as we see the increase in wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, in the sorts, the signs point to the fact that the end is close at hand. However, we must understand that we, when when I began this teaching, I talked about the dispensations of God. And in those dispensations, and this is a real important uh, um, um, concept, you enter into one season, but yet as you enter into the season, 
You're going to see a semblance of the previous season that you were in. And in what you're going to see are two types of fall and you're going to see summer. Or as we go from fall into winter, we're going to see parts of fall and then we're going to see parts of winter. And it's going to go back and forth until the new season takes hold. And I believe that that's what's happening, even with the drying up of the Euphrates River and a lot of these other things that are happening in the earth. We're really in the middle of two seasons, and they're, in a sense, they're fighting one another. But believe it, the latter season is going to take hold here. And remember, in the beginning of this teaching, these dispensations being uh, uh, similar to seasons, the old season can look like it's not over. People are still going to be talking about how blessed they are, and yes, they are. Talking about how great God is, and God can't be greater than he is now. <laughs> but the reality is, these events, as we've been talking about, are eventually going to be overshadowed by the new season, where the Antichrist takes hold, and he begins to implement his end-time plan. Allowing, let me put it this way, as God allows him to carry it out. Because all he's doing is fulfilling prophecy. Now, the coming dispensation of the millennial reign of Christ, and that's the next one. We're in the dispensation of grace. But the coming dispensation, when we enter into that thousand-year period of time where Jesus Christ rules and reigns on this earth, referred to as the millennial or 1,000 millennial reign of Christ, and the end time events that lead up to it, they have begun, yet the full impact of them have not been realized because we have a restraining force. Remember, we talked about that. Things are going to get bad, but understand, things cannot get as bad as they could be or as they're going to be as long as the Holy Spirit is in the earth. Remember, he's the restraining force. That's ensuring that these things do not have full rule, full reign in the earth while God's people are here. And so as Revelation 16 verses 12 through 16 reveals, as we just read, the kings that remain in the earth. Remember, this is after the catching away of the church. You and I are gone. The dead in Christ have raised, been raised and the church has been raptured out and we've been up in heaven celebrating the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so during this time, there are kings that have re that had rejected Christ, and they're remaining in the earth, and they're gathering their troops and traveling up the Euphrates River, and they're bracing themselves for this war of Armageddon. And the word Armageddon is composed of two Hebrew words, and it refers to a geographical location in Israel. The Hebrew word R A R, the beginning part of it means a hill or a city. And the literal translation is for Mageddon is in reference to the place where the battle will be fought or in Megiddo. And this is a war that will be fought on the mountain or a large hill located in the city of Megiddo. Now, where is Megiddo located? Megiddo is a city in ancient Palestine located north of Samaria. And Samaria is an ancient city and state in Palestine that was located north of present-day Jerusalem, get it, east of the Mediterranean Sea. Because Israel is going to play, or I should say continue to play, a major part in the last day events right up to the end of this dispensation. Megiddo is also referred to as Mount Megiddon, M-A-G-E-D-D-O-N. And as we read in, in, in verse, 13, verse 13 here, it's a Hebrew name for the place where the kings of the entire earth at that time is going to assemble under the direction of demonic spirits for earth's final battle. It will be a place of a great slaughter, being the place where the wicked are recompensed or rewarded for the deeds they committed while in the earth. 
And their greatest sin is rejecting Jesus Christ, as we all know. So Megiddo is going to be the place of the final victory of God over all the evil forces of the world. And the full representation of the Antichrist, the first beast, remember, we said that there's a political ruler. The second beast, which is the false prophet and the dragon, the, who is the at that point the embodiment of Satan. They release unclean spirits of demons that go out to persuade the kings and the people of the earth to make war against the Nazarene, Jesus Christ. And as verse 14 says, the kings of the earth, they come into unity and they gather together for that great day of God Almighty. And called by the Antichrist and influenced by these demon spirits, they're led to the mountain of Megiddo. Now, this final battle is fought from an earthly perspective in a very strategic location. Today, Megiddo is a fortress in the middle of the desert. It's a place where many battles have been fought. And it is surrounded by miles of open land and humanly impossible for anyone to surprise whoever occupies it. I saw this myself when I was in Israel in the mid-90s. And we were on Mount Megiddo. We were right there. We were in the fortress that the battle is going to be fought from. It's a stony place. There's not a whole bunch of stuff in there. It's, it's a place that is set up for war. And as the kings of the earth strategize for this battle, the surprise that they get is that it's not going to be a war that is fought horizontally, as the attack is not going to come from an earthly perspective. It's not going to be jets. It's not going to be tanks. It's not going to be troops on the ground. This battle is going to be vertical. And the people that the kings of the earth and all of their armies are going to be fighting against is going to be descending from heaven. And this war will be between the inhabitants of the earth as all godly influences have been removed and we who are believers are now gone. And we return at this point to the earth with our Lord and our loved ones to take our earthly inheritance. And Revelation chapter 19, it shows how Jesus Christ defeats Satan and the wicked kings of the earth. <laughs> My friend, this is an amazing time for every person that made Jesus Christ their Lord. Every promise God made concerning the rapture and the destiny of Satan, they find fulfillment right here. And we will all watch and participate in this epic battle that finally, after thousands of years, settles the score with Satan in the natural. Spiritually, you got to realize that the fate of Satan was settled the moment he rebelled in heaven. Remember Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14? God cast him down. His fate was settled. But now, the fullness of Satan's sentence is realized. Look at verse, uh, verse 11 of Revelation chapter 19. John writes, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head, were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Remember the book of John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here it says his clothes was his, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. Verse 14, and the armies, of, uh, armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it, the sharp sword, he should strike the nations. 
And he himself will rule the nations with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of our almighty God. And he has on his robe, verse 16, and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, I said this during our, our teaching on God's kingdom. A king is the ruler. The Lord is the owner. And being king of kings, this tells us that he is the ruler of rulers. And being Lord of Lord, he is the owner of owners. He owns everything. He rules everything. There is no, there is no one before him. There is no one after him. He is it. And his name is Jesus Christ. Verse 17 it says, then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and and great. Verse 19, and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Verse 20, then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, which we saw a little while ago, in those who worshiped his image. And these two, the beast and the false prophet, the political antichrist or the first antichrist and the false prophet or the second antichrist together, now naturally, and it says, and those who worshiped his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which, which proceeded out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Now, as we gather with Jesus Christ in this battle, we will be given white horses and be clothed with fine linen, which represents purity and holiness. Now, the battle begins. Yet, instead of guns, missiles, and nuclear weapons, this battle will be fought with a sword. But it's not going to be a natural sword. It's going to be a sword that proceeds from the mouth of the master. Now, in this particular battle, as we have you know, a, a, a spiritual foresight at this point, what Jesus is doing is he's giving us the example of how he expects you and me to use the spiritual weapon of the sword of the spirit in our, our fights from today. Remember Ephesians chapter 6? And so as we use the sword of the spirit in the same way that Jesus does in order to conquer all of the enemies of the earth during this time, get this. He wants you to do the same thing, putting Ephesians 6 into action. Now, as I end this teaching today, as the battle intensifies, verse 19 says that the Lord deals with the political Antichrist. He deals with the first beast and the religious Antichrist, who is the second beast. Now, they are both thrown alive into the lake of fire and brimstone. And as I said prior, this brimstone today, we would know it more as a sulfur. And this becomes their final place. There, you know, a lot of times when people go, we say, we lay them down to their final resting place. Understand, this is not going to be a place for them of rest. It's going to be a place of, for them of torment. Because this fire is never quenched. 
and it does not kill its victims. It torments them forever and ever and ever. However, remember this. There is a third enemy of Christ. Those were only two of them who were thrown into the lake of fire. And this third enemy of Christ is the embodiment of Satan at the time, who is referred to as the dragon. His time has not yet come. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick up right here next week, looking at the effects of the lake of fire and possibly getting into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ as these teachings begin to wind down. So again, Pastor David, thank you so much for tuning in, knowing that I love you guys. I'm praying for you. And I really believe and trust that the great things that God has for your life are going to increase and abound as you have more knowledge of his end time plan and how that plan ties into your life as a believer. And so until next week, know this, I love you, God bless you, and we will talk to you then.